Lord, I thank you so much for the message today. I pray that it will impact our hearts, Lord, and I pray that your spirit will give us boldness to preach the gospel and help us to always be in the mindset that we are in a spiritual war for the lives of people. Father, may you equip us and bless us to go out today to share the gospel and to be bold with all of our friends and our family and strangers, Lord God. I pray for me today that I will be able to preach your word and that any truth that I am able to share would just remain in their hearts and their minds. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so my target text today is going to be chapters 25 to 27, but we're going to be ultimately looking at the life of Isaac, so I'll be reaching outside of those chapters just to try to give you a full picture of his life. So, if you've been in church for any length of time, there's almost no doubt that you've heard the phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God refers to himself in this way, so for these men, this is a very big privilege. This name of God emphasizes the covenant that God made with Israel and the Israelites' special place as God's chosen people. God repeated the Abrahamic covenant to three different generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were all given the promise, the promise of land, many descendants, and blessings. The Lord first calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan. He establishes a covenant with him. And then God reaffirms that same covenant with Abraham's son, Isaac, and later on with Isaac's son, Jacob. The Lord who established and ratified this covenant is rightly called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're pretty familiar with Abraham, but today we're going to look at his son, Isaac. And it's interesting because compared to his father, Abraham, or his son, Jacob, also known as Israel, he's not talked about nearly as much, though he is older than both of them, as we will see. In a very respectful way, he's almost like the stepping stone that leads to his own son. However, what we are told about Isaac is that he is faithful, both to his father and to his heavenly father. Today, we'll be spending time surveying the life of Isaac by understanding who he is, what he did, and what his family was like. I will then attempt to bring it in and hammer it home on how Isaac's life relates to the gospel as a whole, and we can try to glean some practical applications on how we can be like Isaac. I want to provide you with some brief facts about Isaac as an outline, and then I want to go into the scriptures and see exactly how Isaac fits these descriptors. First, we got Isaac is the child of promise. Isaac is Abraham's only son. Isaac is a type of Christ. Isaac is faithful. Isaac is blessed by God. And Isaac only has one, right, one wife, Rebekah, whom he loves, and she is appointed to him by God. So, who is Isaac? Let's look at Genesis 17 and look at verses 15 to 21. That's Genesis 17, verses 15 to 21. I'm reading from ESV. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. So this leads to my first point that Isaac is the child of promise. This is the first time that we hear a specific name or the person that God is talking about. We see that God has determined before Isaac was born that he will establish a covenant with him as an everlasting covenant between him and his offspring. Isaac is the one that God specifically gave to Sarah and Abraham in their old age. And Isaac is the one from whom many nations will flow. The buildup is real. I can only imagine the thoughts that are running wild in Sarah and Abraham's mind about how God will use this boy. I have no doubt in my mind that Sarah and Abraham were excited to tell Isaac about the covenant that God made with him and how he intends to use Isaac. 
I have no doubt in my mind that this is something that was reiterated to him over and over again. I can only imagine that Isaac was taught from a very early, very early age of who God is, how faithful he is, and how to worship him. Compared to Abraham, we don't really get a whole lot about Isaac himself, but the first story that we do see is quite impressive. The next large section that we're going to look at is how Isaac is Abraham's only son, how Isaac is faithful, and how Isaac is a type of Christ. I'm sure most of you are well familiar with the story and all the richness that's packed in here, but today, if you can, let's try to focus specifically on Isaac and how this event pertains to him rather than Abraham. I want you to also be on the lookout for some indicators on how Isaac is a type of Christ. Let's remember, a biblical type is something that points to and is fulfilled in something greater in the future, called the antitype. <clears throat> Let's read together Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. It says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay there with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He then, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar. There he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay a hand on your boy or do anything to harm him. For I know now that you fear God, seeing you have not held your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of this place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not, held, have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose, and they went together to Beersheba, and lived in Beersheba. Now, after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Shesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jiplath, and Bethuel, Bethuel father Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, this concubine whose name was Remua bore Teba, Gamma, Tash, Tahash, and Mekah. Sorry again, I don't read Hebrew very well. Tough names, amen to that. So compared to Abraham, wait a second, sorry. Three times in this passage, we see the phrase, your son, your only son. It is clear that God sees Isaac as Abraham's only son, even though Abraham physically has Ishmael. God can say this because Isaac is the son of the promise. He is the son provided by grace from God 
and not through the works of unfaithfulness like Ishmael bore Hagar. Isaac is faithful. It is estimated that Isaac is anywhere from a young teenager to 37 at the oldest. There's no doubt in my mind that Abraham and Sarah have told him repeatedly from the day that he was born that he was a miraculous child of promise and that God blessed him in their old age. Again, there's no doubt in my mind that they haven't done their best to raise Isaac to love and to know God, to serve him faithfully. Isaac should have a pretty decent understanding of what his identity is, though maybe not fully just yet. But he knows that his life is of great importance. He's been told by his parents that nations will flow through him and that he is blessed by God. And yet here we see in this story, Isaac begins to notice that he is the one that's going to be sacrificed. And there are no indicators given that he tried to rebel against his father or do anything but be submissive to him. This story helps us to see that Isaac is a type of Christ. The foreshadowing of the father sacrificing his one and only beloved son. The son willingly laying his life down. The son carrying the wood to his death. The son being a blessing of the nations through a type of resurrection. Some scholars will even say that this scene happened on the same mountain that Christ was crucified on. This scene is rich in gospel imagery. The story of Isaac demonstrates, number one, that he loves his father, that two, he is obedient, and three, he has faith in God. No doubt that this event solidified both Abraham and Isaac's faith. They saw firsthand the most real and profound way how God is faithful, that he provides, he does miracles, and he has a great purpose for this child. Some similarities that we see between Isaac and Jesus from this story are, Isaac and Jesus were both their father's only son. Isaac and Jesus were accompanied by two men on their way to be sacrificed. Isaac and Jesus carried the wood for their sacrifice. Isaac and Jesus were the sacrificial lambs. Both Isaac and Jesus are identified as sons of Abraham. Both were offered in a sacrifice. Both were offered on the land of Moriah. Both were bound and placed on wood and both willingly allowed themselves to be offered in sacrifice and we see both were given back in a type of resurrection. What's interesting is that we don't really hear much of Isaac after this. Many people, again, assume that he's a young man, teens, maybe 20s, maybe even 37 at the oldest, but regardless, we don't really get to see much of his early life. The next time we are told of his life is in the divine providential giving of his wife in chapter 24. So let's go ahead and get to chapter 24. I'm going to skip around a little bit again just so we can get through everything in time. But let's look at chapter 24 and we're going to look at verses 14 to 21. Verses 14 to 21. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her, with her water, on, with her jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into a trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Rebekah is the woman that God appointed for Isaac. Not only is Isaac the child of divine promise, but we see that his wife is also divinely appointed to him. We're introduced to Rebekah, and she seems to be a woman of good faith and character. Jump down again and we'll look at verses 55 through 66. 55 to 66. Her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days, after that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. 
And they called Rebekah and, and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they went away, Rebekah, her sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servants and men. And they blessed Rebekah, and they said to her, O oh, sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gates of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer la Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. We see that she willingly and promptly returns with Abraham's servant when we are reintroduced to Isaac. And they go and he meditate. He goes and he meditates, and that's when he sees Rebekah. We are told that they got married, and he loved Rebekah. Chapter five, uh, chapter twenty-five begins by wrapping up Abraham's life, and it mentions that he had other children and what became of them. The narrative then really begins to focus on Isaac and his family. We are then told that Isaac received all that Abraham had, and let's look at verses nineteen through twenty. Chapter twenty-five, verses nineteen to twenty. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, uh, the Aramean, to be his wife. The text tells us that Isaac was forty when he took Rebekah to be his wife. Not exactly the early start when you think that he's going to have nations flowing through him. Then we quickly see that they're barren for 20 years before the twins are born to Isaac when he's 60. And imagine the internal struggle they must have been feeling, waiting so long without an offspring, knowing that they are to have many descendants flowing from them, let alone knowing that you are going to be the one that God is going to use to have your descendants be as numerous as the stars. The temptation is so strong to try and fulfill God's purposes within their own human reasoning and timing. From our perspective, it doesn't make sense to have such a delay. But God knows exactly what he's doing, and he's doing it on his timing. The number 40 in the Bible is important because it represents transition. I think it's intentional because it's going to show that there is now a transition from Abraham and Sarah to Isaac and Rebekah. Generation 1 was faithful and obedient to God. How will the second generation be? Let's read verses 21 to 23. Uh, and Isaac prayed to the Lord to, for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled within her, and she said, If it is thus, why, has this happening? why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. We see that Isaac is fervently praying for his wife to get pregnant, and God answers that prayer. But what we also see is a little disheartening, because now that the couple is finally pregnant, God, uh, there's issues. And so God lets Rebecca know that the twins inside of her are two divided nations, that the older will serve the younger. And this is countercultural, and the firstborn son is the one who's supposed to receive a double inheritance. This detail is important to remember as the next few chapters unfold because we need to get a clear picture of what happens to remember that Rebecca is a woman of character and that we need to see how the story of the younger and the older play out. Verses 27 through 34. 27 to 34. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling. Sorry, lost my place. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking his stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. 
Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank and he rose and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I'm going to let that just sink in, but I'm going to skip this for now because I want to continue the story of Isaac. So, now, as we enter into chapter 26, we're going to come back and look at them later. Because we have not yet really seen Isaac do anything significant as an adult. So far, all that we've seen is that he's taken a wife from Abraham's family line and bore two sons by the age of 60. So let's, let's pick it up in chapter 26, verses 1 to 5. And now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in the land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will also give you your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. We see in verses 1 to 5 that Isaac went to Gerar and king of Abimelech, and, uh, to, uh, Abimelech the king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, dwell in the land that I will give you. Sojourn in the land, and I will be with you. I will bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all of these lands. I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offsprings as the stars of the heaven, and I will give to your offspring all the lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. This is the moment when God establishes this covenant directly with Isaac, during a famine, as he's on his way to Egypt. God tells Isaac not to continue his trip to Isaac, to, well, continue his trip to Isaac, and Isaac obeys. God instead tells Isaac to stay in the place, and he will show him and manifest his presence there. The Lord reminds him that he will receive a blessing, not because of anything that he did, but because his father obeyed him. Isaac is a recipient of lavish grace. Verses 6 and 7. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my female relative, or sister as it's translated. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. How disappointing. I mean, God literally just appeared to Isaac and told him that he will be with him and bless him and give him descendants as numerous as the stars. And the next thing that we are told is that he pulled the same lie that his dad did. A chip off the old block, if you will. And it's easy for us to see this and think, wow, really? Didn't you remember God's promise? But how often do we do that too? How often do we forget? How often do we reject or push aside the promises of God when we start to fear? Or when things start to go as we don't plan? Or when there's actually real danger at hand? How often do we feel responsible for making God's promises come to pass? We can't forget, too, that we see Abraham as a man of God. But we can recognize that he's also not perfect. I mean, after all, Abraham pulled this move twice, two separate times. And we know that his heart and his devotion was to the Lord. I think these passages are good for us because it helps us remember that even the biblical greats of the faith weren't perfect. And again, we see in verses... 8 through 11, that it was a long time that this lie was going on before they were caught. By calling Rebekah a family member, it bought Isaac time. It allowed Abimelech the ability to get to know Isaac. Thankfully, it worked out well for him because Abimelech, when he finds out, he instead blesses Isaac and puts protection around him and Rebekah. Isaac, instead of being punished for his action, receives even more grace in that, Abimelech makes it known to everyone not to touch or harm them. Verse 12. And Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and had possessions of flocks and herds of many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his, father, that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, 
for you are much mightier than we. God remains faithful and blesses Isaac so much that he became very wealthy and had many possessions. He was blessed so much that the Philistines envied him. Now, it's important to remember that the Philistines are typically in opposition to God and to Israel throughout the Old Testament. They closed the wells originally dug by Abraham, which means that they were so opposed to him that they closed wells in the desert during a famine. We see that God's blessing Isaac's harvest, and he wasn't dissatisfied with Isaac to the point of abandoning his covenant with him, but rather God blessed Isaac, maintaining his faithfulness to the family. God gave him all of their, all these riches and possessions during a time of famine, which these things wouldn't normally come about. I think that it shows supernatural blessings. In verses 16 to 22, Isaac moves around because the Philistines ask him to leave because of all the influence and the disputes over some more, some more wells. Isaac is walking in the blessings and the ways of his father, and we see that the Philistines don't want to associate with these blessings from God. I mean, again, multiple times, they're closing wells that are dug in a famine. The text shows us an utter rejection of the things of God when they close these wells. God then reappears to Isaac and reminds him of the promise made. Let's look at verse 23. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and will bless you and multiply your offspring for, Abra for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. God is yet again reminding us, reminding Isaac of how he will be faithful to him and bless him on account of his father. Hi, Abby. <laughs> Isn't it great that God will continue to remind us of who he is and his intentions for us? I don't know about you, but I constantly need to be reminded of the things of God. There's so much here, and there's so much that we need to remind ourselves with all the different promises that God has for us. And what's Isaac's response? What is Isaac's response to the Lord? To the Lord's reminder. Come here, baby. He builds an altar for worship. We also ought to worship the Lord whenever we are reminded of his promises. Let's continue reading. Verses 26 to 34. 26 to 34. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's... Wait. Oops, I got lost somewhere. Verse 26 to 34. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahuzath, his advisor at Fikol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done nothing but good to you. Not quite. And have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Again, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day Isaac's servants came to him and told him about the well that they had dug, and he said to them, We have found water. And they called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is called Beersheba to this day. Verse 34. When Esau was four years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Abimelech, his advisor, and his commanders recognized that God's hand is in Isaac's life so much that they came out basically to get on Isaac's good side. They say, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you and that you are the blessed of the Lord. How, I mean, how great is that? I wish someone would be able to say that about my life. I think this paragraph shows us that for their own sake, the Philistines make a covenant with Isaac that neither party will do harm to each other, that there will be peace in the land. God has given Isaac this land like he's promised, and the wells that his servant dug brought forth water, which I believe was a sign from God signifying that he was with them. 
the text then transitions back into Isaac's home life. And although my primary focus is on Isaac, discussing his sons and having a good understanding of them is important to us as we go into chapter 27. But also just for understanding Isaac's life a little bit better as a whole. Now we can go and look at Jacob and Esau. So turn back a page or so, and let's look at the description of the two boys and the selling of their birthright story, because it's so important that we see and understand the details of the story. Before reading, I want to make a claim that this story, when read in English, loses what is more plainly rendered from the understanding of the Hebrew text. And I want to preface with this. As I approach this section of scripture that begins to talk about the two brothers, I am coming at it with this understanding. One, so far from what scripture says about Rebecca, I am concluding that she is a godly woman who loves the Lord. Two, I am holding strongly to the fact that Rebecca is the only one that's heard God's prophecy about the brothers when she prayed. And three, as godly parents, Isaac and Rebecca would have raised their boys to serve and worship the Lord and they would have been repeatedly reminding them the promises that God made to them and their descendants. Lastly, and I think this is the biggest point, there's a very important word in this passage that gets used to describe Jacob. The, word, the Hebrew word is Tom. Here's what that word is defined as. Complete, usually moral, pious, specifically gentle, dear, blameless, perfect one, quiet. An adjective meaning integrity or completeness. This is a rare, almost exclusively poetic term, often translated per perfect, but not carrying the sense of totally free from guilt. Now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and let's look again at uh, 25 verses 27 to 28. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob was quiet. Jacob was Tom, man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. I'd like to suggest to you that when we read, that when people describe Jacob, they often think of him and they misinterpret and they say he's a conniver, he's a deceiver, and he, he just steals his brother's blessing and he tricks his, his, his father Isaac. But yet even so, God is still merciful to him to maintain his promise. And that's what oftentimes we see, and that's sometimes what they say in the Bible headings. But if I may, I'd like to try to labor and suggest a different point that I think the text is trying to say. I think it's painting a picture for us that much like Cain and Abel, you have two brothers flowing from the same godly parents, yet stand in total opposition to one another. And I think these two represent two types of people. The description that we get is of Esau, is that he's a skillful hunter and a man of the field. So we kind of get this picture that he's this wandering, strong, warrior-like man. Contrast that with his brother Jacob, who was Tom, dwelling in tents. And what I think that the scripture is trying to show us is that Jacob was this upright, pious man who was staying back in the tents. Some biblical teachers have even made the point that dwelling in tents is connected to someone who is devoted to the scriptures. I'm not going to focus too much on that final part, excuse me, not, not focus on that final part, but I think the picture that the text is trying to show us is that you have Esau, this older brother who's the strong hunter, and then you have Jacob, this younger, more pious, upright one. And it's with this understanding that I would like to approach this section of Esau selling his birthright. Let's read the story again with the understanding that this scripture is painting Jacob as a more man of integrity, someone who is upright. Let's read again verses 29 to 33. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me have some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Well, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is the birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So basically one day you have Esau coming to Jacob because he wanted some food, and he was exhausted. 
But shortly after that, he says that he was going to die. Sounds a little dramatic to me if someone's just a little tired. So I think what you have is that one day, Esau was sincerely near the point of death, and he needed nourishment. So he comes to his brother, Jacob. And so Jacob, being someone who cares for, longs for the heritage of the family, he knows the importance of the birthright, makes a genuine offer. Albeit a little crafty, right? But he makes a sincere offer. Hey, I'll give you this food. Send me the birthright. He wanted it. He asked for it. That was his deal. And we see that Esau gladly takes it. He says, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? Just give me that. So he, Esau takes the legitimate offer from Jacob. Again, which I think is made because he valued this birthright. If what we're understanding the word Tom to be upright and complete, then we would have known that Jacob was technically born second, but he desired that firstborn right. And so he sees his opportunity and he presents an offer. And Esau accepts. And it says, that, I mean, the text says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau's living for the moment. He's not caring about this blessing that, again, has been told to the family multiple times. So we see that Esau's not really caring about this heritage that comes, but we see that Jacob desires it, and he sees an opportunity to get it. So he presents the deal. Esau takes it. Jacob legitimately is purchasing the right to be the firstborn child. I think that's how I see it. Now, let's jump back to our place in chapter 26, and let's read verses 34 to 35. So now we're in chapter 26, verses 34 to 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Buri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Esau takes a wife from a different country. This is a common way that scripture informs us that when a person takes a wife from another country, he's not living for God. This signifies that he did not want to walk in the ways of his father. He did not want to be a part of the blessing of Abraham. Consider how important it was for Abraham that his son Isaac get a wife from his own people. I mean, he sent a servant out to go do it. We will see that Jacob ultimately takes a wife from the descendants, from Abraham's descendants as well. Verse 35 says, This marriage and these women made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Let's move on to chapter 27, verses 1 to 4. Chapter 27, 1 to 4. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat and that my soul may bless you before I die. Well, we know that men of God in the Bible typically knew roughly when the days of their death were upon them. And while Isaac didn't know exactly when he was going to die, he could see that his, his days was, were approaching. So he started to bring in his boys. He said he's old and he can't see, which has, I think, spiritual implications as well, because he doesn't know of the prophecy that was given to Rebecca about the older serving the younger. He doesn't know exactly that the selling of the birthright has gone down. So he is physically old and his eyesight's going going away, but he also spiritually doesn't see everything that's going on as well. So he calls in Esau to receive a blessing. Now, Esau knows that he sold his birthright. What should Esau have done when Isaac calls him in to give away this birthright? I think that Esau should have said, Dad, you know what? This right no longer belongs to me. I've sold it to my younger son, my younger brother, Jacob. So I'd like to suggest that maybe Esau is the deceiver here because he was the one that was trying to get a blessing that no longer belonged to him. He was going about it as if everything was normal. But we know that Jacob bought it from him fair and square. He's going to try to receive a blessing that is no longer his. Let's read verses 5 to 13. Verses 5 to 13. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to her, his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, I've heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me some game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. 
Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats, so that I, I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and shall seem to be mocking, as if I'm mocking him, and a curse will be upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, Let your curse be upon me, my son, so only obey my voice and go and bring them to me. Again, the temptation is to think of Rebekah as this deceiver, because she's the one to go get Jacob to fill him in on what's going down, so that he can receive the blessing, but not Esau. But we need to remember the description that we've been given of Rebekah. She's a godly woman. She was the one appointed to, for Isaac. She is the one that God has prophesied to, that the older will serve the younger. Rebekah spiritually knows that Jacob is the one to be receiving the blessing. That's why she can so confidently say, let the curse be upon me. So in keeping with what God has declared to her, she begins to bring it about. In fact, we should be picking up on this one thing that Jacob was the one that was skeptical about the whole thing, and that he knows he's the one that's rightly the firstborn now. So Isaac obeys his mother, which again is a godly characteristic. And I would suggest from verse 12, Jacob is the one that didn't want to be the, the deceiver. Now look at verse 19. In verse 19, when Isaac asks who is before him, Jacob says to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Now. It is true that he is rightfully the firstborn, legally the firstborn son, but I think he is continuing as Esau and not just saying, uh, hey dad, uh, mom told me you wanted to bless Esau, but he actually sold me his birthright a while back, and so now I'm the real firstborn. Right? That would have, it would have been really messy. Um, in fact, it would have even been shameful if he exposed Esau's sin, despising his birthright in front of his father like that. So, albeit not exactly the best way to go about it, Nonetheless, Jacob is rightly receiving what is legally his. Verse 27 to 29. So in verse 27 to 39. Tw sorry, 27 to 29. So he came near and he kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of the field, and that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and bless everyone who blesses you. I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to go down to verses 38 through 40. Verses 38 through 40. Esau said to his father, I have you. Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me. Even me also, O father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And, e and Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, away from the dew of the heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. I mean, hey, no doubt Esau feels cheated, and he's angry about this blessing. He now has to serve Jacob? But I see something here interesting in verse 41. Look at verse 41. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. Who told her these words? If Esau said these things to himself, who told Rebekah? I wonder if it wasn't the Spirit of God. The text doesn't say it, but I find it interesting that it's written this way. So, Rebekah sends for Jacob and sends him off to her family to protect him. Then the chapter concludes with a pretty strong word from Rebekah, loathing her life because of these Hittite women. No doubt, this was a messy situation. And it's true that Jacob, to some extent, did have to receive Isaac to receive the blessing. But again, ultimately, he's receiving what is rightfully his. He bought it, and the Lord said that the younger will serve the older will serve the younger. So again, ba based on the understanding that Jacob was upright, I think it was done through good intentions. In fact, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11.20 says, By faith, 
Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Though his intentions were never to bless Jacob, the blessing he offers him is in line with the covenantal promises of God to his descendants. Isaac trusts that God will be faithful to bring about these blessings to the family, and he can therefore confidently bless his sons in this way. Though, though Isaac thought that he was blessing Esau, we see ultimately that God's will was to always bless Jacob, and that's exactly what happened. When the narrative picks up in chapter 28, as Isaac is sending Jacob off, he blesses him and instructs him to take a wife from his family line. And the text never speaks of Isaac reprimanding his son, but rather he sends him off with a blessing. I think this speaks to the godly character of Isaac, and I think it demonstrates that he made his blessing in faith. Now that his blessing has been spoken, it will come to pass. How can he be angry? This is the last that we hear of Isaac until his death record in chapter 35. We are told that he lived to be 180 years old, full of life, full of days, and was gathered to his people. Again, Isaac's life, compared to Abraham, or Jacob, or even Joseph, his grandson, is pretty uneventful. The stories we get from him is that he was offered up by his father for sacrifice, and he went along with it. We see that God divinely gave him a wife. We see that God gave him two sons who have their own set of issues. We see that he dug some wells and settled in a land. We see that he was tricked into blessing the wrong son. And in the Isaac section of scripture, we almost see more of his family than we do of him. Nonetheless, we see that God had his hand upon him and blessed him richly because of his father Abraham. Isaac, like all of us, was imperfect. Yet he goes down in the hall of faith and has the privilege of God referring to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the child of promise. He lived a life of faithfulness, yet he was still imperfect. He, unlike Abraham or Jacob, only had one wife that he loved all the days of his life. So how does the story of Isaac impact us? In the New Testament, in Galatians 3.29, it says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Also in Galatians chapter 4, verse 28, Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. From the family line, we get Jesus, our Messiah. And once we belong to Christ, we, like Isaac, become children and heirs of the promise. And we are ultimately the descendants of these men, and we can see that God has been abundantly faithful through the generations to bring his promise to pass. For thousands of years, God has been bringing his people into his family, and he's still bringing these people in today. Nations have come from this family, and if you are in Christ today, you benefit from this story because you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the faithfulness of God keeping his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In closing, how can we be like Isaac? It's simple. We can be people of faith, seeking God in all things and living faithfully. We may not be perfect, but we know that God is faithful. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to go through your word. I know it was a lot. Um, I just pray that you will, again, be letting the truth of your scriptures be soaking in our minds and in our hearts, Lord God. I pray for all of us that we will go out again in boldness to share the gospel and the good news, that the Lord is faithful, Father, and that, um, that we can be brought into his family, and that we can be heirs of the promise as well. In Jesus' name.